Hello and most welcome to 1122. Now we're heading off in the article of Stephen M. Rosen, uh, The Body of Paradox, and we went into Prajna, which is the southern Chinese Zen school to solve the problem on how to heal the paradoxes when there is nothing to heal. What sort of starting point should we have? And I must say, I really like the uh, Southern School's idea how to solve it. It's, it's brilliant, it's smart, it's effective. The second body of paradox is the Möbius strip. In preparing the approach to a thoroughgoing embodiment of ontological paradox, the Necker Cube experience of perspective integration may be delivered more tangibly. For this, we turn to the field of qualitative mathematics known as topology, the study of properties of surfaces, and begin with the comparison. A cylindrical ring cylindrical ring well it starts with a strip and you turn one end of the strip one half turn and then you attach the ends of the strips and voila you got the movie strip. A cylindrical ring, figure A4, as I showed, is constructed by cutting out a narrow strip of paper and joining the ends. The surface of Möbius, figure 4b, may be produced simply by giving one end of such a strip a half a twist through an angle of 180 before linking it with the other. The cylindrical ring possesses the conventionally expected property of two-sidedness. At any point along its surface, two distinct sides can be identified. Now, in the Möbius case, it is true that if you place your index finger anywhere on the surface, you will be able to put your thumb on a corresponding point on the opposite side. The Möbius strip does have two sides, like the cylinder, but this only holds for the local cross-section of the strip, defined by thumb and forefinger. Taking the full length of the strip into account, we discover that points on opposite sides are intimately interconnected. They can be thought of as twisting or dissolving into each other as being bound up internally. Accordingly, mathematicians define such pairs of points as single points. And the two-sidedness of the Möbius strip has but one side. Yet, it's a ring, but it has only one single side. <laughs> If the Möbius property of one-sidedness is difficult to imagine in the abstract, it is very easy to demonstrate. For instance, when you draw a continuous line along the whole length of the strip, upon returning to your point of departure, you'll discover that your ink mark has covered both sides of the surface. 
do think about that. This is not the conventional idea of space at all. And until you meet upon the Necky Cube, the Möbius Strip, and what's coming next, you will be still in the ordinary idea of space. That's the very important part that Stephen M. Rolson tried to clarify for all. Doesn't matter if you're a student of philosophy, if you study philosophy of science, science of cognition, neurology, or if you're a common layman, doesn't matter. You will all have good use of a truer, more encompassing. So space will become something for you that you can use in your life that could come to your advantage, that can make everything more possible. It is important to recognize that the surface of Möbius is not one-sided in the homogeneous sense of one single side of the cylindrical ring. It is one-sided in the paradoxical sense, one-sided and also two-sided, for the local distinction between sides is not simply negated with the expansion to the Möbius as a whole. In coming to interpenetrate each other, the sites do not merely lose their distinct identities. Möbius oneness is essentially similar to the oneness of the perspectively fused Necker cube. There is inside and there is outside. The two are different yet they are also one and the same. The relationship between the Möbius surface and the Necky cube can be understood as analogous to that between a sculpture and a painting respectively. The two art forms are both external representations of inner inner dimensions of experience like thoughts, intuitions and feelings but the sculpture by making significant use of three dimensions instead of two can express the subject matter more concretely flesh it out through the tactile sense as well as the visual in like manner, since the movie strip is a two-dimensional surface embedded in three-dimensional space, it can embody the paradoxical union of opposites more concretely than can the lines of the schematic cube, limited as they are to a two-dimensional medium of expression. Nevertheless, while the Möbius model delivers one-sidedness more tangib tangibly than the cube. It is a model, an outward symbolization of the union of inside and out, rather than a full-fledged embodiment directly incorporating the inner depths of subjectivity. What would be needed for the latter? Not a two-dimensional body enclosed as a mere object in three-dimensional space but a body of paradox that is itself three-dimensional. And now we get into the third body of, of paradox. There exists a higher dimensional counterpart of the Möbius surface. By way of introduction, consider an interesting feature of the Möbius, its asymmetry. Unlike the cylindrical ring, a Möbius surface has a definite orientation in space. It can be produced either in a left or a right-handed form, 
depending on the direction in which it's twisted. If both a left and right oriented Möbius surface were constructed and then glued together, superimposed on one another for a point, a topological structure called the Klein bottle would result, named after its, its discovery, the German mathematician Felix Klein. <coughs> So one left oriented, one right oriented. And that means turning the strip 180 degrees to the left, in one case, glue them together, and in the other case, 180 degrees to the right. Put them together, and voila, you get a Klein bottle. <coughs> the Klein bottle has the same properties of asymmetric one-sidedness at a two-dimensional Möbius surface, but embodies an added dimension. Note that we cannot actually produce a proper physical model of this curious bottle. That is, left and right facing Möbius bands cannot be superimposed on each other in three-dimensional space without tearing the surfaces. I am going to suggest that this inability to objectify the Klein bottle in three-dimensional space derives from the fact that the bottle indeed calls an inner dimension into play. There is a different but mathematically equivalent way to describe the making of a Klein bottle that, for our purposes, will be very instructive once again a comparison is called for We here have two rows of torus. The upper row is a torus and the Klein bottle is coming into construction in the lower road, row. Both rows of figure 6 depict the, pro depict the progressive closing of a tub tubular surface that initially is open. In the upper row, the end circles of the tube are joined in the conventional way, brought together through the three-dimensional space outside the body of the tube to produce a donut-shaped form, technically known as a torus. The torus is a higher order analogue of the cylindrical ring. By contrast, the end circles in the lower row are superimposed from inside the body of the tube, an operation requiring the tube to pass through itself. This results in the formation of the Klein bottle. Indeed, if the structure so produced were cut in half, the halves would be Möbius bands of opposites, handedness. Very interesting actually.
It's simple geometry and topology, but it's still incredibly interesting. This results in the formation of the Klein bottle. Indeed, if the structure so produced were cut in half, the halves would be Möbius bands of opposite handedness. But in three dimensional space, no structure can penetrate itself without cutting a hole in its surface, an act that would render the model topologically imperfect. So from a second standpoint, we see that the construction of a Klein bottle cannot effectively be carried out when one is limited to the three dimensions that frame our experience of external objective reality. Mathematicians are aware that a form which penetrates itself in a given number of dimensions can be produced without cutting a hole if an added dimension is available. The point is nicely illustrated by Urukur. He asks us to imagine a species of flatlanders, we had those before, attempting to assemble a Möbius strip. Rucker shows that since the physical, i.e. externally experienced reality of these creatures would be limited to two dimensions, when they would try to make an actual model of the Möbius, they would be forced to cut a hole in it. Of course, no such problem arises for us human beings who have full access to three external dimensions. It is the making of the Klein bottle that is problematic for us, requiring as it would a fourth dimension. Try as we might, we find no fourth dimension out there in which to execute this operation. I suggest that the fourth dimension needed to complete the formation of the Klein bottle engages the inner dimension of human being. It is not just another arena for reflection, one that stretches before us, rather it's folded within us, entailing the pre-reflective depths of our subjectivity. But to fully grasp the nature of the Klein bottle's missing dimension, we must better understand the general meaning of dimensionality. Next paragraph is about the classical treatment of dimensions. And I would say it's somewhat similar to the idea of classical logic. A logic that is no longer valid, but still called classical. But there are some differences We'll see about that now. <coughs> the notion of dimension or space proves to constitute the third crucial factor of our analysis. In experience as governed by predicating I, there is the object, the detached subject before which it appears. Very important. Do take note of this. This is also a clue to understanding Sein und Zeit. Very, very important. I'll even repeat it. In experience as governed by the predict predicting, predicating I, there is the object, there is the detached subject before which it appears, and there is space that which mediates between object and subject. Thus, in the thinking of Kant, perception of particular objects and events are contingent, always given to variation, 
but all perceptual awareness is organized in terms of an immutable intuition of space. In the words of Fuller and McMurray, Kant took the possession that no matter what our sense experience was like, it would necessarily be smeared over space and drawn out in time. Implied here is the categorical distinction between what we observe, very important, the circumscribed objects, and the medium through which we make our observations. We observe objects by means of space. We do not observe space. Kantian space is rooted in Plato's notion of the receptacle, the container, if you like. In Timaeus, Plato asserts that we must make a threefold distinction and think of that which becomes that in which it becomes and the model which it resembles. Three full distinction. The first term refers to any particular object that is discernible through the senses. The model of the transit, transit, transitory object is the eternal object, i.e. the changeless form, archetype or idea, idos, that furnishes the template for the work of the demiurge, the god or the divine subject, who creates the particular objects, and that in which the object becomes is what Plato called the receptacle. Plato's trichotomy generally corresponds to the terms we have been working with. The subject, the object, and now the containing medium of the objects, the receptacle. He describes the latter as invisible and formless, all-embracing. It is the container of all changing forms that itself does as space. The Platonic notion of space constituted the seed for a concept that was to come to fruition and play a critical role in post-Renaissance science and mathematics. The key to a deeper understanding of classical space was given by Plato himself. It lay in his belief that the receptacle itself can have no holes or discontinuous. Discon Continuities, discontinuities, very important. It's an assumption that I would say was already present by Plato's time. He just expressed it. And since I think saying it as I just did is confirming what we already know. The only thing that can question that or put that into wonder or uh, an object of investigation, I would say, is the third body of paradox, the Kleinbottle. <coughs> At the heart of the matter is the idea of the continuum. Space, in its essence, the space of Plato, Euclid, Descartes and Kant is continu continuity and continuity entails extendedness. Consider as an illustration the one dimensional space represented by a line segment. In the classical approach to the line it is intuitively clear that however short it is it has extension. Then it must 
be continuous. It can possess no holes or gaps in it, since if the point elements composing it were not densely packed, we would not have a line at all, but only a collection of extensionless points. The quality of being extended In the classical approach to the line, it is intuitively clear, however short it is, it has extension. Very important as well. It has extension, it doesn't matter how short it is. <coughs> then it must be continuous. It can possess no holes or gaps in it, since if the point elements composing it were not densely packed, we would not have a line at all, but only a collection of extensionless points. The quality of being extended implies the infinite density of the constituent point elements. Yet at the very same time, reflection discloses that the classical continuum possesses a property that prompted the mathematician Charles Muses to refer to it as a discontinuum. For the absence of gaps not only holds space together, but also permits it to be indefinitely divided. Without a gap in the line to interrupt the process, there is no obstacle to the endless partitioning of it into smaller and smaller segments. As a consequence, though the points constituting this continuum indeed are densely packed, they are distinctly set apart from one another. However closely juxtaposed, any two points may be a differentiating boundary permitting further division of the line always exists. And this is also the creation of a single point particle or a zero dimensional particle. Could you see that? The line in classical thought is an absolute predisposition to have zero dimensional single points matter. It's connected to the idea of division uh, them being divisible. As Capet put it in his critique of the classical notion of space, C-A-P-E-K, Capet, no matter how minute a spatial interval may be, it must always be an interval separating two points, each of which is external to the other. Here we also have externality to be established. The infinite divisibility of the extensive continuum also implies that its constituent elements themselves are unextended. Consequently, the point elements of the line can have no internal properties, no structure of their own. An element can have no boundary that would separate an interior region of it from the, uh, what would lie on the outside. All must be on the outside. Very good. This sets everything to be defined from the outside, not the inside. 
I should have a climb bottle with me here. But do you get it in this abstract form as well? Very sorry I didn't bring the climb bottle. Should be here to make it more clear. But everything from that point onward is 100% on the outside, nothing on the inside anymore. The infinite divisibility of the extensing continuum, think about line, also applies that its constituent elements themselves are unextended. Consequently, the point elements of the line can have no internal properties, no structure of their own. An element can have no boundary that would separate an interior region of it from what would lie on the outside all must be on the outside as it were in other words the classical line consists not of internally substantially concretely bounded entities but only of abstract boundedness as such sheer externality alone holds sway what heidegger calls the outside of one another of the multiplicity of points. Moreover, whereas the point elements of classical space are utterly unextended, when space is taken as a whole, its extension is unlimited, infinite. Although I have used a finite line segment for illustrative purposes, the line considered as a dimension unto itself actually would not be bounded in this way rather than its extension being terminated after reaching some arbitrary point in principle it would continue indefinitely this means that the sheer boundedness of line is evidence not only locally in respect to the infinitude of boundaries present within its smallest segment we see it also in the line as a whole, inasmuch as its infinite boundedness would be infinitely extended. Of course, this understanding of space is not limited to the line. Classically conceived, a space of any dimension is an infinitely bounded, infinitely extended continuum. Naturally, it would be a category mistake to interpret the infinitude of classical space as a characteristic of what is object. Very important as well. <laughs> Again, space is not an object, but is the context within which objects are manifested. It is within the, within the infinite boundedness of space that particular boundaries are formed boundaries that enclose what is concrete and substantial the concreteness of what appears within boundaries is the particularity of the sub object let us say in short that an object most essentially is that which is bounded whereas space is the contextual boundedness that enables the finite object to reappear. We have seen, moreover, that the spatial context is what mediates between object and subject. This third term of classical accounts refers to the unbounded. This is implied by Descartes, who held that whereas objects are extended in space and therefore, therefore fully constrained by its laws, 
that is the laws of motion. The subject is utterly unextended, thus freely transcendent of space. It is before this unbounded subjectivity that bounded objects are cast. In parenthesis, duly noted, the word object comes from the Latin objicere, to cast before, and of parenthesis. In sum, the crux of classical cognition is that of object in space before subject. The object is what is experience, the subject is the transcendent perspective from which the experience is had, and the space is the medium through which experience occurs. Note here, and this is also very important, Note here the special role played by the continuum. It is the continuity of space, its absence of gaps, that confers closure. Objects are sealed into their containing space, thus are sealed off from the uncontained subjectivity before which they appear. This is a very, very condensed form of what Heidegg is trying to point to. Very condensed, but repeatable and putting it on the refrigerator door, read it every day, and of course have a Klein bottle or a Möbius strip ready at hand. And I think understanding will come with time. But do remember, this has been the case for 2,500 years. Extant mathematical thinking unquestioningly adheres to this classical structure. There is the mathematical object, a geometric form, or algebraic function. The second we will look into further with Jude, Jude Currivan later in a later lecture, maybe tomorrow. The space in which the object is embedded and the seldom acknowledged subjectivity of the mathematician who is carrying out the analysis. And that is also uh, very important. That is what the latter is what Descartes called res cogitans, and the object is res extensa, and space, it was subsumed, and that is the place where all experience can sort of act out the stage for everything. A stage that doesn't have any properties to speak of, it doesn't have any holes, it doesn't turn, it doesn't have any qualities or properties of such. <clears throat> Extant mathematical thinking unquestioningly adheres to this classical structure. There is the mathematical object, a geometric form or algebraic function, the space in which the object is embedded, empty, no properties, and the seldom acknowledged subjectivity of the mathematician who is carrying out the analysis. And that is the same as Richard Eileen's uh, reflective consciousness. It has left the body, it doesn't have any substance, it is pure res cogitans, no extension, no depth. Thinking, therefore, is not taking place in space and so forth. It is no different than when mathematicians feel obliged to invoke higher dimensions of space, extra dimensions are summoned into being by extrapolation from the known three-dimensionality of the objective physical world. This procedure of dimensional pro proliferation is an act of abstraction, presupposing that the nature of dimensionality itself is left unchanged. In the case of the Klein bottle, the fourth dimension required to complete its formation remains an extensive continuum Though this higher space is taken as imaginary, the Klein bottle for its part is regarded as an 
imaginary object embedded in this space. The procedure of dimensional proliferation, prof proliferation is an act of abstraction presupposing the nature of dimensionality itself is left unchanged. Very, very important. In the case of the Klein bottle, the fourth dimension required to complete this formation remains an extensive continuum, though this higher space is taken as imaginary. The Klein bottle, for its part, is regarded as an imaginary object embedded in this space. Whereas the cylindrical ring, Möbius surface and torus are real mathematical objects in the sense that tangibly perceptible models of them may be successfully fashioned in three dimensions. I never thought about this. I'm just so amazed. I need to put a break here. <laughs> it's just beyond belief. Of course, it's very, very condensed. <clears throat> you know, this by Rosen comes in a very condensed format. Uh, thank God we studied Heidegger so much. And I think all the, already the foundation we laid uh, in the first 200 episodes of the series were very important. Where Heidegger took up a hundred, I think. Hmm. And I also, when I read, I see back and forth at some of these things I've been sorting, pondering about, <coughs> but not this clear. <coughs> and second thing, there is also resistance. And I would say that resistance can only be, be overcome by repetition. There is a most definite resistance to abandoning what we are used to in this case. And this is much, it's so fundamental, it's very, it's even hard to put into words. And this is what Rosen is doing so eloquently, but very condensed. And this is incredibly similar to uh, something I remember uh, The constructive mathematician in U.S. when Brouwer came to a meeting when he made his tour, and they all criticized him, but somehow they felt him to be right. Uh, a sense of unease, even sickness. And I think Kaufman he got actually sick when uh, Brouwer was in Princeton. So and uh, the jokes about Brouwer, him being crazy and calling all the mathematicians schizophrenic, they echoed in a way that sounded hollow. I think all those things are very interesting. And since it's very hard to give up the intuition of the excluded middle in math, among mathematicians, uh, when Brewer went to the US, must have been in the mid in between the mid um, between the wars at the mid war period possibly 50 percent of all the mathematicians were by then uh, platonist or outspoken platonist today i would say 99 percent there are very very few because this shows how important this intuition is and it's shared by everyone and it's transferred with the speed of light through the internet and communication in the institutions. So this is a habit we need to break through from. Why? Well, for once, why be played by something you don't have any access to?
are let us say in short rules and continues that an obvious most most essentially is that which is bounded where a space is the contextual boundedness that enables the finite object to appear we have seen moreover that the spatial context is what mediates between object and subject the third term of the classical account refers to the unbounded this is implied by Descartes who held that whereas objects are extended in space and therefore fully constrained by his laws that is the laws of motion the subject is utterly unextended thus freely transcendent in space it is before this unbounded subjectivity that bounded objects are cast. In some, the crux of classical cognition is that the of object in space before subject. And this is also criticized or shown to be an oversimplification by James J. Gibson. His affordances is a step into the direction of the Klein bottle, including the subject. To repeat, subjectivity itself is the detached Richard Elin reflective consciousness or the transcendental signifier. The transcendental signifier I would say is the proxy for the subject. He, although seemingly placed somewhere outside of the subject, well, that's most possibly because the subject is not extended. Subjectivity itself is the detached position from which all objects are viewed, or better perhaps, from which all is viewed as object. This is how objects comes to existence. Without having the subject as res cogitans, there can be no res extensa. They are mutually dependable. They are created simultaneously. And by addressing this problem one-sided, we will not be able to dwell deeper into it because we are forgetting the subject and this is happening in all new age literature and in most philosophical criticism of reductionism and so forth that's why these things never ever will work that will never happen that will take a incredible degree of intellectual dishonesty it is just tricking yourself and you will be like many potents of the church, nervous, scared, losing your faith. Or uh, people like Churchland, venomously saying that everything is conscious. It doesn't really mean anything if we don't go into these founding things. There is a need for Heidegger. You cannot skip him. So glad I didn't skip Heidegger now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> never is subjectivity as such open to view. We never look inward. The inwardness is shut out already at the outset. Outset. In this way, the classical split between object and subject is upheld, and the rule of the predicating I prevails. Well, let's go into the non-classical character of the Klein bottle. In his phenomenological study of topology, the mathematician Stephen Barr advised that we should not be intimidated by the higher mathematician. We must not be put off because he's interested 
only in the higher abstractions, we have an equal right to be interested in the tangible. There is a tangible fact about the Klein bottle likely to be neglected by the higher mathematician, an intuitively discernible feature that makes one wonder how appropriate it is to treat this structure simply as an imaginary object embedded in four-dimensional imagery space. To bring out the property in question, I will compare the Klein bottle with a tesseract, a mathematical entity frequently used as an example of four, a four-dimensional structure. The tesseract is taken as an imaginary extrapolation The tesseract is taken as an imaginary extrapolation of the three-dimensional cube to four spatial coordinates. Each of the faces of this hypercube is itself a three-dimensional cube defining the lower limit or boundary of the higher dimensional structure. Just as a real three-dimensional cube is bounded by two-dimensional surfaces. Were a hypercube face to be viewed from the three-dimensional vantage point, only a cube would be perceived, since a face is a closed form, complete in itself, and totally indistinguishable from any ordinary cube. Not the slightest hint would be given of hyperdimensional extension. <coughs> so, quickly put, the tesseract is a purely imaginary higher dimensional entity with a simple real lower dimensional boundary condition. Thus it would be impossible even to approximate a tangible model of a hypercube in three dimensional space. The only portion of it would of it we could realize there would be the ordinary cube. In contrast to the Tesseract, the Klein bottle is not purely imaginary, since as we have found, a model of it can indeed be approximated in real space. But we also have discovered that, unlike the Taurus, the construction of the Klein bottle cannot properly be completed in three-dimensional space, that the model necessary will intersect itself, creating a whole, something that would not have to happen if another dimension were available to finish its production. It is this curious dimensional hybridity of the Klein bottle that is bypassed in the abstractions of standard mathematical analysis, because the standard approach has presupposed the extensive continu continuity of dimensions since the time of Plato, very important. It cannot come to terms with the reality that lies between dimensional continuum, continua. That is, it cannot deal with a phenomenological fact of structure that is neither concretely containable in the three-dimensional continuum as a torus is, nor simply associable with an imaginary four-dimensional continuum, as in the Tesseract. The inherent discontinuity of the Klein bottle lies in the whole created by itself intersection. We have seen that conventional mathematic mathematics circumvents this necessary whole by an act of abstraction in which the Klein bottle is treated as a properly closed object 
embedded in a higher dimensional continuum. As Im also implicit in this classical approach is the detached subjectivity of the mathematician before whom the object is cast. I suggest that by staying with a whole, with only H, we may bring into question the classical conception of object in space before subject. Here is the torus getting into space itself. This is the turning thing of the Klein bottle. And the whole thus produced or made or already being there, depending where you are in time, so to speak. Let us look more closely at the hole in the Klein bottle. This loss in continuity indeed is necessary. One certainly could make a hole in the torus or in any other object in three dimensional space, but such discontinuities would not be necessary in as much as these objects could probably assemble in space without rupturing them. It is clear that whether an object like the torus is cut open or left intact, the space containing the object will remain closed. In rendering such an object discontinuous, we do not affect the underlying continuity of space in which it is embedded. <coughs> With the Klein bottle it's different. Its discontinuity does speak to the continuity of three-dimensional space itself. For the necessity of the hole in the bottle indicates that space is unable to contain the bottle the way ordinary objects are contained. We know that if the Klein an object is properly, properly, to be, properly to be closed, assembled without a hole, an added dimension is required. Thus, for the Klein bottle to be accommodated, the three-dimensional continuum must in some way be opened up, its continuity challenged. Of course, we could attempt to sidestep the challenge to skip over the hole by a continuity, continuity maintaining act of abstraction, as in the standard mathematical analysis of the Klein bottle. Assuming we do not employ this strategy, what conclusions are we led to regarding the higher dimensions that is required for the completion of the Klein bottle? If it's not an extensive continuum, what sort of dimension is it? Earlier I hinted that the Klein bottle's missing dimensions engages the inner dimension of human being. It is not just another framework for reflecting upon objects, but a dimension entailing the pre-reflective depths of our subjectivity. Let me now attempt to make this clearer. We have seen that the classical paradigm presupposes a free full categorical disjunction, contained object, containing space, containing space, uncontained subject. The contained constitutes the category of the finite particular, the empirically factual, the imminent contents that are reflected upon. The containing continuum is a normative universal serving as the means by which reflection occurs. The uncontained is the transcendent agent of reflection. It is only when we adhere to this platonic Kantian trichotomy that the idea of dimension is associated exclusively with the second term, the continuum. This Free party division is confounded by Kleinian dimensionality. 
the necessity of the hole in the Klein bottle suggests that, in actuality, the bottle is not a mere finite particular object, not simply enclosed in a continuum as are ordinary objects, not open to the view of a subject that itself is detached, unviewed or uncontained, rather than being contained in space. The Klein bottle may be said to contain itself. Thereby superseding the dichotomy of container and contained. You see how elegantly the Klein bottle gives a visual and an abstractable, abstractable conception of a wholeness, a bit like progena. It is the negation that could be the goal. <clears throat> Rather than being reflected upon by the subject that itself remains pre-reflectively out of reach, the self-containing and Kleinian object may be said to flow back into the subject. These paradoxical relations can be discerned in a helpful schemata for the Klein bottle provided by the communications theorist Paul Ryan. My adaption of Ryan's diagram is given in figure 7. Here you see the part uncontained, the subject. Here we have the part contain, the object. And here we have the part containing, space. And here you see the torus entering in itself. So it makes up for its own space. No longer do we have res cogitans, res extensa. <clears throat> Ryan identifies the three basic features of the Klein model as part contained, part uncontained, and part containing. Restricting our attention to the region marked off by the rectangular box, we have the appearance of simple containment and uncontainment. But when the frame is removed, we see how the part contained opens up at the bottom of the previous figure to form the perimeter of the container and how this in turn passes over into the uncontained aspects in the upper portion of figure 7. The three parts of this structure thus flow into one another in an unbroken moment. Symbolized there in two dimensions is the process by which the reflected upon three-dimensional Kleinian object in the act of containing itself is transformed into the pre-reflective four-dimensional that is inner dimensional subject incredibly important at such a nice condensation of Heideggerian slash Heraclitian thought elsewhere I noted the resemblance of the Klein bottle to the hermetic vessel of all alchemy. The design of the enigmatic vessel is essentially that of the Ouroboros, the serpent that consumes itself by swallowing its own tail. To contain itself, the serpent must inter intersect itself, an operation requiring a hole, 
corresponding to the opening that is its mouth. The hole in the Klein bottle is of this sort. It's neither solely a hole in a container nor a hole in that which it contains, but a hole produced by the act of self-containment that integrates the container with its contents in this way giving wholeness. And this is wholeness with a W in parenthesis. You see, whole and wholeness come together. There is no whole without a whole. Without the Klein bottle, we have to make do with the detached subject res cogitans. There is no doubt about that. You can never walk away from the three dimensions as established by Euclid, Plato and so forth without having the Klein bottle. It's absolutely impossible and you have to understand that. You can't internet, intuitively leave it. You can't take LSD, you can't get a trauma to the head. It doesn't matter how many koans you consume. You can go to the Indus Valley and walk along the Ganges for generations. It will never ever happen because it's fixed, you're used to it and without ha having this first abstract notion of something else you won't even have the stamina or the inclination to do the incredibly hard work of leaving res cogitans, res extensa and the space where it dwells. It will not happen it is a bit like turning us in south, inside out. The process that took place in alchemical, alchemical vessels was also often described as a circular distillation. A transformative circulation of substances that was in some way turned back upon itself. It is the fluid Kleinian circulation from contained object to containing space back to uncontained subject that unites the reflective and pre-reflective in an embodiment of ontological paradox. The Urobori Klein bottle is, re is reflected upon content that is that in containing itself flows unbrokenly back into its own pre-reflective ground. That ground is the Klein bottle's missing dimension. We may indeed say that all reflected upon contents originate in the pre-reflective, but in the case of an ordinary content, we cannot move back into its ground without abstraction, because this content appears simply contained very important. It's just contained. Closed onto its spatial container in such a way that it's closed off from its pre-reflective source. Only a self-containing object of reflection can incorporate its pre-reflective origin without a break. It should be clear by now that we cannot end the rule of reflection merely by attempting to break with it, since such a breaking is itself reflective in nature. This realization finds expression in the general strategy I have employed. To abide in the reflective mood, to carry out the concretization of ontological paradox with, within reflection's own province. By thus challenging reflection from within itself, by following its very own trajectory, we have arrived at its inner horizon, its natural point of termination, its true end. Of course, the true end of reflection cannot merely be an end, since it would then be but the outcome of reflection. For reflection truly to end, we must have paradox, and an end that is not an end, and a boundary that is not a boundary. It is this that is embodied in the Klein bottle. At the inner horizon 
or boundaryless boundary of reflection, we flow beyond reflection, engage the pre-reflective, while yet continuing to reflect in superseding reflection from within itself. We never break contact with it, like the movement from one side of the Möbius strip to the other that paradoxically keeps us on the same side. Our Kleinian movement from reflection to pre-reflectivity at once maintains the reflective. So you can have the cookie and still eat it. The cake, sorry. But now, instead of one side domination by reflection, there is a harmony with the pre-reflective. I will also compare this to Francisco Varela and Umberto Maturanas and their autopoiesis and how they show that once you have a mouth and then you have an anus, entrance of food, perception, movement, exodus of food, perception, then you also have directionality. You have an up, you have a sort of down, you have a left, you have a right. None of those things are possible without having a hole going into the hole. Also has a connection here to John Appleton's idea of sidedness. And in the three dimensional, as long as you have that, there cannot be anything up or nor anything down. There can't be any boundaries because they are not real. They are sort of, so to speak, transcendental. You left the hemisphere of reality to dwell into the transcendentalism of Plato. A place that where he didn't want to be himself even. But trust me, it would take practice. I think Brewer mentioned it could take three to four years to leave uh, Platonic mathematics and go into constructive mathematics is also much more cumbersome. It will not be simple at until the very end. Before that everything will be more complicated. You are so used to the three dimension and the rest cogitans to abandon it will take an effort and you will be lost at times. I think as also as Jan Eisken says we today do not balance ourselves or coordinate ourselves with our inner feeling, our proprioception, kinesthesia, uh, our balancing system. No, we are using our eyes and try to balance ourselves by using the three-dimensional idea of up and down. But those, as you can see here, do not work. They assume a little bit too much. And that assumption has never been looked into until Heidegger, I would say, carefully. And it's also the same assumption that is tacitly questioned by quantum mechanics, where the observer, the containing object, the containing thing, the space, and the thing that is seeing the containing thing, the subjects, are all regarded I say thank you very much and have a very pleasant afternoon.